So this psalm is introduced before we even get to the scripture part. It says it's a contemplation of a man by the name of Ethan the Ezraite. Do you have that written in your Bible? Ethan the Ezraite. And I thought to myself, who is this man, Ethan the Ezraite? And why should we listen to him? Does this man have credence? Does he have credibility to speak to our lives? Well, certainly the Holy Spirit thought so. He's here listed in the Word of God. So there's something about this individual, but who is he? Would you go with me to 1 Kings chapter 4, and we will discover who Ethan the Ezraite really is. First Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 29. It says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom, wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman, and Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. Now, I don't know if that means much to you, but it seems to me like Solomon was the wisest man, and then there's the next guy in line. And his name is Ezra, uh, Ethan the Ezraite, which says to me that if he had wisdom, and we understand this from what he says in the psalm, that he gives all declaration and all glory to God, that Ethan the Ezraite was a God-fearing man, and no doubt he was touched by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring forth wisdom into the earth. I think I want to sit back and hear from a man like this, don't you? It gives us credence and credibility to understand that this is a man of God. This is not some just weird author that we, we can't learn from. This is somebody that heard from God and was willing to speak forth the, the promises of God, the blessings of God, and the mercies of God. So this is who we're hearing from. So let's go back to Psalm 89. And recognize that this man just in these first four verses has something to say to us about God being a covenant-making God and that there are promises. Ethan begins his psalm, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. How many of you have ever sung that song in church? You know how that song goes. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. That's a nice quaint song, isn't it? But what does it say about our God? Ethan says that God's mercy is eternal. I want you to take that in for a moment. If God begins to make a covenant with you, I want you to know that the mercies last beyond the altar experience. That His mercies continue to be poured into your life into the next day. And if you're obedient and follow in the holy fear of God, that mercy is going to continue into the next day and the next hour and the next moment and the next week into the next month. Because I meet all of these people that have a glorious experience with God but it seems like you talk to them maybe six months later and, eh, it's not what it was. I think God has more for us than that, don't you? I think he has more than just a rosy experience at an altar somewhere or where you got all excited about God. I believe that he has mercies to pour out to you. And other psalms say that that mercy is new every morning. I think we have such a small view of God and, and I, I hope Ethan... The Ezra Height and myself working together with this psalm, we can open up the heavens and see the largeness of God today. Amen? That his mercies are new every, every morning, that they are everlasting, and there's a sense that we can walk in the everlasting mercy of God, that he can literally pour that out into our lives on a daily basis. I need that. How about you? I need that mercy to be extended to me 
because I know all too well what it's like to walk in the flesh and make mistake. How about you? I know all too well what it's like to trip up. Even though I love God, even though I, I love the Word of God, I know what it's like to trip up. And I, and I hope that when I do trip, that I can look up and the hand of God is extended to me saying, my mercy is still with you. I still love you. And I'm willing to extend my hand to you and pick you up. Now that's different altogether than backsliding and turning my back on God. That's something altogether different. I'm talking about the failing forward experience. Where you're in this relationship but you don't quite know everything and wisdom is being poured out to you and as you learn, well then you grow and mature in the things of God. He picks you up and extends that mercy. That mercy extends beyond our earthly experience. I want you to take you to the moment of when you breathe your last breath and you enter into the eternal realm. I want you to know that if the fear of God is upon you and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need not fear that last breath because beyond that last breath is the mercy of God that takes you from this realm into the eternal realm and says, my promises are true and adequate and I will continue to maintain them for all eternity with you if we will be but faithful. What happens, I think, too many times is fear grabs a hold of us and we forget how large God is and we get confined by our circumstance and we don't allow the mercy of God to flow. We instead choke up our life with fear. And once we're choked up with fear, we cannot access any of the blessings. We cannot access any of the promises because we are the ones that are literally choking them from our lives. Does that make sense? So Ethan the Ezraite says, Let, let's, let's get out of the circumstance that you're in for a moment and let's look up and see how amazing God really is. Let's see his mercy extended into our lives. Then he says this. Verse 2. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you, you shall establish in the very heavens. Once again, Ethan the Ezraite is trying to show us a large scope of God. If the circumstances of life have you, Ethan is trying to say, look up. The faithfulness of God is in the heavens. Did you notice that the sun didn't need your help to stand where it's standing this morning? You didn't worry about it, did you? The sun at God's command, faithfully, in our part of the country, comes up in the eastern sky, travels across, and sets in the west. And so Ethan is trying to say to us, don't you get it? The faithfulness of God is literally written in the sky. People are always asking, well, as soon as God shows me a sign, well, then I'm going to respond. How much more sign do you need? The heavenly bodies, without your approval, without anything that you have to say about it, faithfully does exactly what it's supposed to do. And you enjoy the benefits. If you enjoy summertime, well, you're enjoying the benefits of what God does. If you prefer wintertime, just wait a few months. It'll be here at the end of August. Recognizing that God's faithfulness to trek through the seasons and to trek through what he does in the heavenly realm is right there in his hands. Why don't we trust him? Lily and you were saying, oh, I'm, so, I'm a Christian and I'm a mess. I understand what you're saying. It's because we have a small view of God and we, we forget that his largeness and his faithfulness is literally written in the heavens. If he does that in the heavenly skies, can't he much more take care of us? As Jesus said, oh ye of little faith. Can he not take care of us and maintain our lives if he's got all of the rest of it under his control? Amen. But we are quick, aren't we, to grab the controls and say, oh, no, 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 no. I've got to maintain this. I've got to control this. And I've got to control this. And God's saying, what are you doing? 
You're literally choking the blessing of God being the favor of your life. And it comes down to a God that is a covenant-making God. How many of you want to be in a covenant with God? I do. We're going to see that the covenant that this man Ethan is referring to is one that David had with God. And it's an Old Testament covenant. But we're going to see this morning that we also have a covenant with God. And if we will walk in the promise and the covenant of God, his blessings will follow. But if we want to just be church people and negate that blessing, that can be your lot too. We can be church people without the blessings of God. We can be pew sitters. We can be students. We can be so educated in the word of God and still not have his blessings. Because we choke them out with fear. There's another aspect to this as well. It's called love. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can speak with the tongues of angels and of men. But if we have not love. You're a sounding brass. And a tinkling cymbal. You're just making a lot of noise. So there's this aspect that. We can have all the church we want and we can dress up and look the part, but if we don't have the love of Christ, then we're really none of his. So I, I started this Sunday school this morning saying, I want to be the real deal. I don't want to be fraudulent on any level. So tear back the hide. God, show me what's in my heart. Show me what's in here. And I hope that I encourage you to do the same. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to wear the mask. If I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to be the real deal. There's enough fraudulent ones out there. Let's be the real deal. Amen? Let's be on fire for Christ. See the largeness of his expanse. Get a glimpse of this God that he is big, he is mighty, he is powerful, he is strong, and he is able far above what we ever hoped or imagined to take care of you and I. He has resources. Do you remember the story of Job? Job, do you know where I keep my storehouses of, of hail and snow? Do you know how the animals respond to my command to, to beget more animals? I mean, do you understand any of this, Job? And his answer clearly had to be, I don't get any of this. I didn't even know you had storehouses of snow. Can you imagine that? I like to see that garage. You know, he just kind of swoops it out on a neighborhood or not. And that, that begins to make my imagination go crazy. What other types of holding tanks does God have? Is there one for eyeballs and limbs? One for hair? <laughs> I'm, <already> <laughs> I'm, lo I'm losing more and more every day, every joke I make. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I, 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 think, I think we don't even begin to scratch the surface of what is available to us. When we begin to recognize the largeness of God, our tendency is to worry based upon fear that the outcome is going to be bad for us. And if we continue in that avenue, Satan is, I got him right where I want him. Go ahead, go to church. Go ahead, sing the songs. Go ahead, and memorize scriptures. Just don't live by faith. Just don't believe God. If, he can, if Satan can get us to live and abide there, he's got us. But if we can begin to believe that God is who he says he is, that he is a God of covenant and a God of promise, and he cannot lie, if we will do our part, he will always maintain his part. Amen? So let's go back to this and look at what he promised to a man by the name of David. Verse 3 of Psalm 89. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Ethan does something here in these verses that only spirit-directed people will do. He quotes the promises of God to anyone that will listen to his songs 
But listen to me on this. More importantly, he speaks back the promises of God to God. Are you hearing me on that? He's speaking back the promises that God said he would deliver, and he's speaking them back to God, saying, God, you promised. Now, why is that important, that we speak back the promises of God? Is it important? We, we, we let God know what we heard. We know what he's saying. Men, did you hear the wisdom that came out of our brother? This is not only useful with God, it will be useful with your spouse. Say back what you heard. Because if you didn't hear it right, man, you're in trouble. Can I get a witness? <laughs> if you didn't hear what she said, you're going to be in trouble in this earth. If you didn't hear what he said, you're going to carry it out in the wrong way. And when we begin to speak back the promises of God to him, we're saying, God, I hear you loud and clear. This is what you have said about mankind. And so Ethan was a counterpart or a, a, of the generation of David's son, Solomon. So now this man, Ethan, is looking back at history saying, we know this to be true because we watched David's life. And now we see the blessings of God not only on David's life, but now I live with Solomon, the son of David, and I see not only are there blessings here, but multitude of blessings overflowing in Solomon's life. For he was the wisest man that ever lived. And Ethan the Ezraite would have known this. He would have said, I thought I was smart until I met Solomon. I thought I was wise until I met Solomon. So he's saying, I know what the promises of God look like. Here was David, the faithful servant, the chosen one of God. He listened to God. The Bible says he, he was a man after God's own heart. And so if David be that type of man that was a man after God's own heart, God made a covenant with him, and the promises were not only available, available in David's life, but they overflowed into Solomon's life. And that's as far as Ethan really knew. The throneship of Solomon would be all that he really understood. He probably died in the same period as Solomon. But we recognize that this promise was a covenant that would continue to last. That this would be a promise that Jesus Christ himself would come out of the lineage, the line of David, and he would assume the throne of power in which Jesus would say, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, and now he sits on that same throne of power forever and ever and ever. He's quoting back the promises of God, saying, I see how far it's come. All I know is that you promised this forever, God. And we have the hindsight of Scripture, seeing we recognize that this was totally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ sits on the true throne of power. All authority. All power given to him. And that throne did indeed and will continue to last into the eternal realm. So what does that mean for us? What is the psalmist Ethan the Ezraite trying to make clear to us? I think it's this. That God is a covenant making God. That he does not lie. And if there was a covenant for David, there's a covenant for you. You don't have the same covenant as David. So what is our covenant? And for that, we're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. love the letter of Hebrews because it is an explanation to Israelite people to help them understand who Jesus was. 
Now you have to understand, before we get into the scripture, if you're a Hebrew person reading this, you're coming from the mindset of the laws of Moses being established. Now if you're an Israelite and you sin, according to the law of Moses, how do you get rid of sin? There must be an animal sacrifice. It's already been ordained and written in the laws that God gave Moses that you're going to have to bring this animal. It's going to have to be you, the worshiper, that takes that sword and severs the neck of the animal. You're going to have to be the one that literally puts your sin upon the, the head of the animal. And you are the one that comes into that worship experience and it was bloody and it was a mess. And you knew at the slaying of that animal how truly gruesome your own sin was. Could you imagine if we had to do that now? I mean, you had to stop by the, the farm and pick up a, a lamb or a, a goat or what have you on your way into church. And some of you had maybe five or six because you really had a bad week. <laughs> I, I mean, we would all know what your life was like because you would be bringing the sacrifice. And instead of coming here and, and hearing a sermon, uh, it would be a, a brazen altar up here. It would not be just this wood, wooden uh, thing here that says in remembrance of me. It would be a, a stone altar, wood arranged there on top, and you would slay the animal and put it up on the altar as a sacrifice to God for your sins. Think of it. Now that was the mindset for Israel for a very long time until Jesus Christ came on the, on the scene. And he would be the one that would willingly be the sacrifice once and for all, no more animal sacrifice. Now you're talking years of culture being changed like that. How would you feel about that? No, 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 no. This is how we've always done it. Isn't that how we are? You can't do that. We've always done it this way. That's why they rejected Jesus. See, we can be very cynical and say, I don't understand. Well, how could they reject the Messiah? Didn't they see it? Didn't they see the miracles? Didn't they see it? Culture is very powerful. When you try to change something within culture that is very meaningful to your relationship with God, it is a very difficult thing to change. So the writer of Hebrews steps in and says, I want you to understand not only that a change has been made, I want you to understand what the change is. And through this explanation to Hebrew people, we Gentiles can go back and read the book and say, I have a covenant with God. And here it is. David's not the only one with a covenant. We also sitting in this room can have a covenant with God as well. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 9 starting in verse 11. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Are you hearing language of covenant here? That there was an Old Testament covenant and God worked different covenants into individuals' lives, such as Abraham, such as David, such as Noah. He made individual covenants, but generally speaking, 
there was an old covenant with the nation of Israel and it was based upon the laws that God gave Moses. But when Jesus suffered on Calvary's tree and the blood flowed from Emmanuel's veins, it was clear from that point forward that God was writing a new covenant with humanity. He's saying you don't need to bring a goat, you don't need to bring a heifer, you don't need to bring a calf. Bring your sins to me and I will forgive them once and for all. No more sin. Now how are you liking this covenant so far? You don't have to bring your farm animals. It doesn't need to smell like a zoo in here. You bring your sins. You bend your knee to Jesus. You say that I accept this forgiveness. The blood of Jesus is now applied to my life. Now a covenant begins to take shape. Let's begin to read verse 16. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore not even the first covenant was de dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood... There is no remission. There are two things, one in verse 15 and now one in verse 22. It says at the end of verse 15 that we receive, we receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. If I recognize that I am a sinner and I bring my sins to Jesus as he faithfully proclaims, Bring your sin to me. I will faithfully forgive you of all unrighteousness, cleanse you of all of your sins. And we bring those to Jesus. He says, here's my covenant with you. You have an, an eternal inheritance with me. How are you liking this so far? And so far, you've done nothing. I remember when we were little, I don't advise this anymore, we were blood brothers with friends. Remember that? You could, you could literally cut a portion of your body and put it together. You're making a covenant with your friends, saying we're brothers. We'll protect one another. We made sure that nobody, nobody stepped in between our friendship. And God's saying, how about this for a friendship? You don't have to really do anything except come to me. I'll take all the punishment. I'll take all the blame. I'll take all of your sin and I'll bear it on that cross. All you have to do is repent and keep a lifestyle in line with repentance. See, that's the part that's often left out. People are easy to repent and say, Oh, I'm sorry for my sins. Yes, now we must keep a lifestyle of repentance. Otherwise, you just go back to your wallowing in the mud. If you had children, you know what that's like. You give them a bath, you get them all cleaned up, and it's only a matter of time before they're all dirty and muddy again, and you've got to clean them up. So what good is getting cleaned up if you're going to go back in the wallowing? And constantly, God, would you forgive me? Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Now, his mercy is there. I understand mercy. But how much more greater would it be if we understood the largeness of God, we understood the covenant of God, we understood the sacrifice of God and say, God, I never want to bring a reproach to what it is that you have done for me. So that when we wake up in the morning, we wake up with a sense of urgency, God, I'm going to carry out your will today only by the leading of your Holy Spirit. That's the only way any of this is possible. I'm going to walk in this covenant. My part is to repent. My part is to keep bearing fruit in line with repentance. That's what I'm going to do. And God says, here's my part. You'll have an, an eternal inheritance with me. 
And then he says in the end of verse 22, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with, with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There are a lot of people that think that through good works, they're going to somehow please God and somehow gain his favor. But here it is clear that without the, forgive, or without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So he makes it clear that he is the one that has done the work. He is the one that has gone to the cross. And your only way of being forgiven, and I don't apologize for this, is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, I don't care how good the argument is, no man comes to the Father except through him. Period. There's this God in heaven. He looks at you and says, I've created you in my image. Not only that, I love you and I want to be intimately involved in your life. Will you allow me access into your life? I've made a covenant on my end with you. All I want you to do is come into a relationship with me and repent of your sins and don't go back to a lifestyle of sin. How easy is that? And yet, for all of how simple this really is. People continue in churches to live fraudulent lives. And it's my duty and my obligation to say, we can't live fraudulent lives and expect the blessings of God to follow. It just can't happen. We've got to be a covenant-making people with God and say, God, if this is your promise and eternal inheritance, I certainly don't want to make a mockery of this. I will repent. I will turn my life. I will be converted by you. And I will be a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. Is that our testimony or isn't it? That we have a new thought life. That we have a new compassion. Remember I was saying about love earlier? Do we have a new compassion for people? Don and I were talking about that yesterday. It's easy to love the lovely. It's, real, it's a very simple thing to love the attractive. But what about the one that doesn't look so well? What if they have a contagious disease? What if they smell like they haven't bathed in years? And God says, embrace them. Yeah, but they're contagious. Do you have a promise with me or not? Can Jesus touch the contagious and not be caught with disease? I mean, we love to brag, Christ in me, the hope of glory. But the hope of glory means that you would have the glorious promise of a new resurrection and that nothing in this earth really will harm you. And even if it does, you'll go to be with him. So why not take a chance and just love people on whatever level they're on and be the bride of Christ. Be Christ to a lost and dying world. We always want the promises, but being obedient is quite another thing. Carrying out our end of the covenant is quite different. And so we have to examine our hearts once again and say, what kind of man, what kind of woman, what am I? Who am I? Am I a person that understands that God is making a covenant with me through the shed blood of Jesus Christ? And through this is an opportunity to walk not only through this world change, but into the eternal realm with his promises upon me continually and forever. Amen? This is the opportunity that stands in front of us. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 23 now. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Can you just stop and think about that for a moment? 
the high priest, this is what the Hebrew writer is saying, the high priest would go into the most holy of holies once a year to make atonement for all the people, himself first, and for all Israelites. No one was permitted into the most holy place except the high priest. And only once per year on the Yom Kippur. Jesus, the Hebrew writer is telling us, didn't just go into the holy place, he went into heaven, heaven itself on our behalf. Does this get anybody excited? That God literally went into the heaven, the place that we talk about, that we want to go one day, I want to be with Jesus, I want to be with, with my my relatives that have gone on to be with Jesus, I want to go to that place in that eternal realm and I want to be with Jesus. He's already there on our behalf. How many of you want to be in a covenant with this individual, Jesus? Because in the heavenly realm, he sees everything. There's no shortages there. Wisdom is plentiful. The supplies are plentiful and he will make sure that your needs are taken care of according to his riches in glory. That's what scripture says. But yet, we can cut off every one of those blessings into our lives recognizing that that's where Jesus is in that holy place, the heavens, the heaven, where God's throne is, that's where Jesus is and he's gone there on our behalf and yet we try to walk through this life on our own, making decisions without him. How foolish would that be? I don't want to be frustrated like that. How about you? In fact, there's no need for frustration and stress if we will yield to a covenant-making God that says, I'm already there on your behalf. What does he do for the, us there? He makes intercession on behalf of who? The saints. Are we talking about the New Orleans saints? I mean, who are we talking about here? We're talking about righteous people who have a covenant relationship with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He says, I am at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. But literally, if you're not a saint, but you're playing games with God, no intercession is being made. There's no connection with God. You have a form of godliness that denies his power. And literally, no power flows into your life because it's only a form of godliness. And so the, all the way back to Ezra, the, he, or Ethan the Ezraite, he's trying to tell us God is like this. He makes promises with you and he does not lie. We've got to get a hold of the fact that God does not lie to us. Do you trust the fact that he's telling the truth? And if you trust the fact that he's telling you the truth, your lifestyle on earth will reflect every reality that you believe him. When decisions cross your table, what do you do with them? It will determine what kind of relationship and covenant you have with God. If you agonize and struggle over decisions, I'm telling you right now, you're not walking in covenant. If you trust God and say, God, this decision's on my lap, what shall we do? And God clearly begins to open the door. Go this way. Walk ye in it. That's how God operates. He's in complete control. Nothing took him by surprise. Everything is known by God and he is willing to make known these things to you if you'll walk in a covenant relationship with him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Let's finish this up. Verse 25, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. 
But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as, is a, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Verse 28 makes me very excited. He will leave that heavenly realm and he will come for us to literally culminate and inherit real salvation. For right now, we only know it in part and parcel. We can only understand his grace, but for a measure. We can only understand his power, but for a measure. But there's going to be that moment in time when we see his glorious face, and then we'll really understand salvation. We'll really understand his deliverance power. We'll really understand it. But what we do now is we wait for his return. He's borne our sins. He has paid the price. He doesn't have to do it twice. He doesn't have to do it a third time. He has paid the price once for all. And our part of the covenant says here that we eagerly wait for him. I don't know if any of you have been given a promise that someone's going to take you someplace special and it was going to be a surprise. How many of you have had that? offer extended to you. It's going to be a surprise, but I'm going to take you someplace special. I've had that with teachers in high school. We're going to, we're going to go on a field trip, and it, I'm not telling you where. I'll tell you what, days like that, I couldn't wait to get to school. I was anticipating with eagerness, what's it going to be like? Or Tammy says, now we're going to, we're going to go out on on Friday night, it's a secret. I'm not telling you where we're going. Ooh, right. Where are we going? What's this going to be like? We're going on a, a date with a fine restaurant and, of course, dessert. I mean, all these things are going through your mind. What, what, what is it? What's it going to be like? The writer of Hebrews says, if you have a covenant with Jesus, you wake up with him eagerly anticipating his arrival. I'm asking you, is that where we're at? Because it seems to me, just in my simple observation of humanity, we tend to wake up with complaint. Whether it be the weather, our body's not cooperating, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. I didn't get enough sleep, uh, I'm moody, I'm anxious, I'm depressed. I mean, we come with all of this. And my question is, where, where's the covenant people of God? Ones that have a relationship with Jesus that wake up with eager anticipation, today could be the day. Today, my Jesus could break through the clouds, the trumpet sound, and we go to meet him in the air. I mean, that'd be a cool, day to, cool way to end the day, wouldn't it? The trumpet blast, the sky spreads apart, the fabric of space and time separate. Jesus steps out of the heavenly realm and says, Come on home, you covenant people of mine. Come home, you who have eagerly anticipated my arrival and have not allowed fear, anxiety, and pressures and depressions of this world to have you, but you were eagerly anticipating my arrival and you were doing my bidding on the face of the earth. That's what a covenant person looks like on this end. And on the other end is Jesus saying, I'm already in the heavenly realm. I'm already here making intercession. I go to prepare a place for you, Scripture says, that where I am, you may be also. Is he preparing a room for you? Because I know this, he's preparing a room for those who are anticipating his arrival. He's preparing a room for those who are in a covenant relationship and honoring their part, carrying out the fruit of repentance, carrying out the obligation of the will of God placed upon your life. I've heard this. Tell me if you heard people talk like this. Well, I, 
I know I should be doing this because I've been gifted that way my whole life, but I don't. <laughs> what? I mean, I don't believe too much in lightning bolts coming out of heaven, but I scoot over from somebody like that. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? How can you be gifted by God and not carry out his divine will? That, doesn't make, that does not compute to me. If God's given you a gift, if he's given you ability, if he's given you talent, every bit of it should be used for his glory. Every bit of it. And God will take care of your earthly existence. That's what I read in this Bible. Men and women who just trusted God, believed him, walked in the talents, gifts, and abilities that God gave them, and they carried it out. And some of their names landed in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Bodies pulled apart, torn apart, martyred for the cause of Christ. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that the world was not worthy of them. How about that for a testimony? The world was not worthy of you because you were willing to do whatever it took to take a stand for Jesus. You used your gifts, talents, and abilities to carry out your end of the covenant. And so we look at this this morning and say... God does still make covenants. He made one with David. He made one with Noah. He made one with Adam. He made one with the nation of Israel. And he makes one with us. For those who will willingly come to him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. His promises are yes and amen. That means he does not lie. It is true, so be it. And when he makes those promises, he says to us, Come unto me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are overburdened with the affairs of this life, and I will give you rest. How could we turn down that deal? Would you bow your heads with me? Quite simply, as genuine worshipers of God... It's us, it's up to us to respond in a humble obedience and then carry out his divine will. And I sense in this room that there's some of you this morning you're saying, I want to make that step. I want to make it firm. I want to walk in this relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to walk in the new covenant of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Not just because of the promises, but because I know it's the right thing to do. And I want to I raise my hand and say, I want to walk in that covenant. Would you raise your hand and say, that's me. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you all over the house. Me too. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word. That you are a covenant-making God, even with us, who did not deserve a covenant. We were not your chosen nation, Israel. We are outsiders to all of this really nevertheless your grace has been poured out to us and how can we refuse such an offer and I pray father that we would leave this place today knowing that we have been charged by your word knowing that there is a relationship that we can have a covenant relationship that comes with promises and blessing and I pray that we would not refuse you but we would be ever understanding ever coming to your reality of truth and walking by the lead of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, in this that you would have for each one of us a job to do and that we would carry that out by the leading of your Holy Spirit as you empower us. I pray for a holy boldness and I pray for that eager anticipation of your arrival to be our heartbeat, that we wake with a new joy in our step not with murmuring and complaining, but rather, Father, to bring you glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving with our entire being, with our words, thoughts, and actions. And we ask this accomplished in the mighty name of Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen and amen. Praise God. Let's take a short break. We'll be back together here in about five minutes for our worship service together.